I'm not letting you Walter Baum here. Today we're talking about Fitzgerald's great story, Babylon Revisited. Now, we have to contextualize this. It's 1931. The Great Depression has not only soaked the money or dragged the money and just dragged the economies of the world into the toilet, it also dragged Fitzgerald's themes. Um, Fitzgerald was so closely tied to the Jazz Age, uh, coin he termed. He was the king and Zelda was the queen uh, of the Jazz Age. So the Jazz Age is over, the party is over, and the public was kind of turning sour on Fitzgerald. He would uh, soon write um, Tender is the Night, um, a great novel, a flawed novel, and a novel that the public wasn't really in tune with because here he's talking about the Riviera and, you know, it's the Great Depression. So Fitzgerald writes what he knows, as every great writer does, unless you're Shakespeare. But here he is, Fitzgerald, an alcoholic, like Charlie Wales, with Scotty, okay, Honoria is the daughter in the story, and a wife that's not dead, but in a sanitarium in Switzerland. So here we have a guy who's struggling, looking back to the ghosts of the past. Right? Fitzgerald was part of the lost generation as Gertrude Stein, and I have Gertrude Stein right here. Um, and she was from Oakland, who famously said, there's no there there, so if you want a there, you move to Paris. Um, and because she's lesbian, Paris welcomed people. Uh, that's why Josephine Baker, uh, the, the famous singer-dancer African-American um, who came uh, from America to Paris, became very, very famous, uh, she found a home in Paris, as many outcasts did. Um, Hemingway came, uh, Picasso came, uh, you had Salvador Dali, you had Cole Porter, you had all these great luminary um, artists descending upon Paris, mostly on the left bank, which is the Latin Quarter, and I'll show you on a map where that is. And there were three reasons why people came to Paris. Number one, it was cheap, right? It was very cheap. Can you imagine being cheap in Paris in the 1920s? Um, but no, Paris was cheap. You could also, secondly, drink legally in Paris. It was prohibition, as we'll find out with the Great Gatsby, and you could openly drink in these cafes and go to party to party to party, as Charlie Wales does, going to the Ritz, going to these different bars in the Pagal and, and uh, where the Red Light District is and the Moulin Rouge. And again, I'll show you on a map where that all is with Google uh, Maps. Um, and, he's, and he's looking back in the past, and he's, I paid a lot of money. And Fitzgerald paid a lot of money. When he says, I paid a hundred, uh, hundred franc note uh, to the barman and a thousand dollars to the orchestra, he did, right? And when we read Gatsby, no, he threw these kind of parties on, uh, on Great Neck out on Long Island. Um, so Fitzgerald really knows what he's talking about. So he's exercising his demons here. And he, the key word in this story is dissipation. To, uh, dissipate has two definitions. One is to disappear, right? To disappear. As if he talks about the ghost, right? The ghost lingering around Montmartre and the Ritz and the French now taking ownership of uh, Paris once again. Because all the money has gone. The, the, the party is over. We're in now a global recession or depression. Um, and the second definition of dissipate means to fritter away, to have something that was so valuable and give it up, give it away. And Charlie Wales realizes he paid a lot of money for things that were not important. What was really important? Family. His daughter, who clearly adores him, right? Look how many times she says, daddy, 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 right? It's like a nail. But think about how painful that must be to have someone who loves you so much but not having the resources, not having the backbone or the fortitude to carry through with your plan. Why? Because the ghosts of the past are not all dead. Okay, so Fitzgerald, let's talk about this dissipation. Uh, in the middle of the story, uh, at the end of section one, he says this, and 
Fitzgerald was great at this. He was, he was able to play the role of the king of the jazz age and partake in the craziness and the drunkenness and, you know, the wild behavior. So he had one foot in the craziness. And then he had one foot in rationality, uh, critiquing the very behavior he was doing, right? So he would go on drunken binges, but then be stone cold sober and write The Great Gatsby and great stories like Babylon Revisited. And we have to understand Babylon, ancient Babylon is known, was known for its decadence. So it's like you going back to the frat house 10 years after you graduated and looking at the craziness that happened and now you're an alcoholic and now you're looking like, oh my goodness, um, I was crazy and I can't do those things anymore, A, because I'm an alcoholic, B, my life is crap, um, and I'm trying to get my life together, but there's still maybe people who are lingering around college who still want to draw you in. And we'll talk about that, but let's get back to this dissipation because it's key, all right? He says, all the catering to vice and waste was on an utterly childish scale. He says this behavior was, was childlike. And suddenly he realized the meaning of the word dissipate. And he puts that in quotes. To dissipate into thin air, to make nothing out of something. In the little hours of the night, every move from place to place was an enormous human jump, an increase of paying for the privilege of slower and slower motion. And then he says later in the story, uh, how many weeks or months of dissipation to arrive at that condition of utter irresponsibility to make something out of nothing now what does it mean to dissipate um, his old girlfriend <laughs> who made months turn into years and weeks into you know months um, is still there married but that doesn't matter the husband just gave her some money just to go away and have fun um, and his friend dunk now Fitzgerald actually had a friend Duncan so that's not if you read movable feast by Ernest Hemingway which is uh, Hemingway's take on the years in Paris, this lost generation. Um, of course, you can't take everything that Hemingway in there says. He has some, uh, it's as an older man, looking back on the past. And of course, he glamorizes himself and he makes Fitzgerald look a little bit more buffoonish um, than perhaps he was. And there was a rivalry between the two. I'm going back and forth between lots of topics here. Um, but Fitzgerald realizes that his life right now is in dissipation. Uh, all this talent, right? Now, of course, Fitzgerald is, you know, the alpha male of, I wouldn't say alpha male, but he is an, an amazing author, um, rightly so. Um, but he felt his talent slipping away, uh, largely because of his unstable family, um, his wife, his own alcoholism. Uh, you can't be an alcoholic and write. And, but he wrote many short stories, uh, marvelous short stories, and he got paid very, very well for his short stories. But uh, his topics, uh, his characters were out of fashion now. Um, the glamour of the 1920s was over, we're in the depression, and here we have an amazing short story written from the time of after the party is over. And you return to the scene of the crime, and you look at all the places that are still there, but have changed radically because you have changed. So the story is an amazing story of such dissipation. And the lesson, I think, there's many lessons you can learn from this, is the idea of there are consequences to behavior and there are people who do not want you to succeed. There are people who will draw you back into the quagmire. And he talks about the cafe heaven and the cafe hell. Um, in uh, in Paris, and it's there, you know, definitely for symbolic reasons, right? The one, the one place, the brick top or the brick house or something is gone, but these two, the heaven and hell, right? He wants to get to heaven. He wants Honoria back. He says he's doing well. He only takes one drink a day, and you know, if you're an alcoholic, you can't take any alcohol whatsoever. Uh, but he uses it as like, I'm doing this deliberately. I'm I'm, I'm making a conscious effort. Uh, but they draw him back, and he slips up, he slips up, and it, he winds up dissipated. He winds up a shadow of himself, um, a great man that has fallen and has recognized that he has fallen. And 
there's two roads you can go by, right? Stairway to heaven. Um, and then he <laughs> slips. And as we'll find out with Fitzgerald, you know, he dies in Hollywood of liver disease, I believe. And you can read these, uh, there's many, many great documentaries and books uh, on Fitzgerald. Um, uh, estranged from his wife, wife still um, in a sanitarium. Uh, she eventually would die in a fire in North Carolina years after uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's death. Um, but he dies in his 40s. I mean, washed up, a hack movie writer that no one really, his books were out of print. Can you imagine The Great Gatsby out of print? So it wasn't until the 1950s um, that he, it was a resurgent time for Fitzgerald. And he stayed. After that time, he has just shot way up. Um, so we can appreciate Fitzgerald and perhaps learn that if we're successful we're trying to get our lives together, the, the last thing you need are, are friends to pull you back. Um, because they don't want you to succeed and they're jealous of you. Um, and somehow you gotta turn into that grit. I know we hear that word all the time. You might be uh, tired of hearing that word grit. Um, and it's tough. It's very, very tough when you're fighting these demons. But to be so aware of the demons and still not being able to conquer them is, is, is tragic. It's tragic. And we have a story here that's so well written. Um, we could do a little literary analysis or rhetorical analysis of the story because uh, Fitzgerald, um, uses so many good color imagery like he does in Gatsby. The glass blue, the, the lights, and it, the Paris is vividly described here um, in all its former glory and it being returned back to normalcy, back, back to the French. Uh, and so he uses a lot of the things that he was using so brilliantly in The Great Gatsby. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.